Thank you for this opportunity to uh, present on something completely different. Um, I am on the advisory board for Exilium related to the uh, new product Xyloflex, but I have no financial involvement. Um, Francois Gigot de la Peroni, uh, King Louis XV's personal physician about uh, 250 years ago, uh, was important in elevating surgeons to the level of uh, the equivalent of uh, medical doctors, and he was uh, a great proponent of uh, surgical therapies at that time. Uh, he uh, wrote a article on five men with nodules of the penis, and the moniker Peroni's disease has stuck ever since. There are variations throughout the world, but for the most part, people look at this. There's a lot of unknowns about this disease, and I thank the organizers for inviting me to present some data, because I do think that there's a cross-pollination that we can learn from these things. Um, Peroni's disease is basically, as we understand it, a wound healing disorder that usually occurs in a potentially genetically susceptible individual who has damage to the tunic albuginia, and there's usually an inviting, uh, inciting event, which we think is microtrauma, probably from intercourse in most cases, and it results in a plaque of some form or another. And the reason that I was invited here, and I talked to three or four of uh, you folk at lunchtime, and rarely do you ask people if they have uh, hand problems, do they have problems in their penis? I guess it's out of your realm. But in the long and short, it's uh, up to 20% of men who have Peroni's disease uh, may have Dupuytren's contracture additionally. Uh, an interesting study that came out of Cologne, Germany, was a male aging study looking at a group of men and reporting on having Peroni's disease. And the surprise was we always thought that Peroni's disease occurred in less than 1% of the population. In actual fact, it occurred in about 3.2% from this study. This was done in the late 1990s. Uh, as you can see, there's an age distribution. As men get older, they're more likely to have Peroni's disease. And if we look at the common clinical complaints, angulation was present in 84% of this group, uh, painful erections in 46%, erectile dysfunction in 40%, and having all three of these in 1%. So this was quite a uh, traumatic finding for many of us urologists to see that this was this common disease. In 1998, when the PD-5 inhibitors hit the market, all of a sudden, when I was talking before about 40% of men with Peroni's disease having erectile dysfunction, a lot of these men, once they regained their erections from medical uh, treatment, found that they had curvatures. Now, successive studies done in Europe, South America, and the United States have shown Peroni's disease occurring up to 9% of men. Uh, many men don't talk about it. Uh, just to mention that we do have a patient-run uh, website, um, uh, proniesassociation.org. It's totally patient-run. They get 400,000 hits a month from around the world. So it's uh, a very common condition. Presentation, physically, I'll show you a few pictures, but I think that one of the things we've got to recognize, it's very much a psychological disease, that it pinches upon men's uh, self-image, uh, many of them are afraid to confront uh, the opposite sex or to talk about it to anybody who is uh, familiar with them, let alone a doctor, so they, they suffer in silence in many cases. Uh, for many of us, it remains a therapeutic uh, dilemma, and unfortunately, there is very, there's a paucity of uh, high evidence-based medicine treatment studies that look at different treatments. Um, just to give you a few pictures, I think here's one guy that bends to the left, Here's another man that bends to the right. Now, what we were taught um, that this was probably a genetically linked disease from ancestry, Northern European. I now practice in New Orleans, and I have a sizable black population with this. To move upon this, we, some people bend downwards. Some people get a little bit more complicated with uh, curly cues that go one way. Uh, sometimes, because I'm a tertiary center, they go the other way. Um, you can get uh, uh, wasting or shoulders that form anywhere along the shaft of the penis. You can get cavitation where you lose the stability. Um, but uh, I think one of the take home messages that I have is that Peroni's disease is very much a heterogeneous condition. 
And I would say that probably Dupuytren's disease, you shouldn't think it is the same type of condition, because I think Peroni's one man's presentation may be entirely different, a number different of, uh, of um, metabolic events or genetic uh, predis pre uh, predisposing uh, factors that may lead to this problem. Uh, by and large, having dealt with these patients clinically, one of the major complaints, because it is a scarring process, is a loss in penile length. And for many men, this is a loss of their self-identity and their manhood. And it's something we've got to recognize and you deal with these patients because they're some of the un most unhappy patients in the world, even after surgery. Uh, the pathophysiology, I won't go into great detail about this, but there may be minor, minor penile trauma that occurs during sexual activity. This is a whole algorithm, but it has to do with probably with micro trauma, it leads to, lead, leads to uh, micro hemorrhage. The fibrin probably incites some form of uh, reaction that eventually forms into a scar. Dr. Devine described the IP, I beam uh, theory, where the septum that abuts upon the dorsal aspect of the penis is more prone to fracture, micro hemorrhage, and over time, scarring that, for, that occurs. And if you look at the uh, numbers, about 70% of men do present with a dorsal plaque as the most common presentation. Now, I won't go because the time is limited into the cellular molecular basis, but there are a number of upstream irregularities that we've looked at, downstream irregularities, and uh, issues that deal with remodeling of the plaque that occurs in most cases or doesn't occur. Um, the surgery is the gold standard, but of course, anybody that wants to see you initially as a surgeon wants to explore the non surgical uh, options. And the early phase of the disease lasts anywhere between 6 and 16 months, so we don't typically operate pe on people before 12 months. Um, patients who have pain usually last anywhere between 5 and 7 months, and we've got to recognize that I'm a lot of times a psychourologist, that some patients aren't really ready for any type of surgery anytime, and you've got to exclude these from your, pop, your, your, uh, your, your treatment uh, plans when it comes to surgery. Uh, the different options are observing for a while. There are a number of devices and treatments. Medical therapies, as I'll talk about, and I won't uh, concentrate at all on surgical therapies. The natural history, looking at a couple of good studies, shows that about 12% of uh, patients do get better within a year. However, about 40%, 45% get worse, and 40% uh, st are stable with the condition when they present. The average age of a man who presents with a peroneal disease is about 57 years of age. The oral therapies, there are few studies that are placebo controlled, but the, for the most part, they don't work. Uh, though there are excessive claims, they're, they're, they're just not uh, well designed, they don't have a placebo arm, which is very important. Uh, Interlesional therapy is the, re is the area that, uh, or minimally invasive therapy that we do offer patients that do offer patients some hope before we embark upon any surgical options. Um, we typically rely on intralesional injections, and I don't have a video that won't work anyway, but uh, that shows that we give a, uh, a, uh, a penile block, and then we use a multi-injection technique into the plaque, which we put a 25 or a 27 gauge needle through and through and deposit the fluid in this area. I will just state that steroids are basically not recommended. They cause tissue atrophy and damage to the superficial tissues, and uh, the rationale is good, but they just don't work, and if you do operate on these patients after, it's a disaster. Verapamil has been used. It works to decrease the fibroblast proliferation. There are a number of studies, but there's a paucity of placebo arms. There's only one study with 14 patients that showed any benefit. It is covered by most insurance companies, and uh, it's very inexpensive. Interference is something that I've been working on and, uh, for a number of years, and interferons themselves both inhibit fibroblast proliferation and also stimulate collagenase activity. My first study, which was non-placebo controlled, showed benefit. Uh, following this, I did a multi-center placebo controlled study, which was difficult to do, but half the number of injections, patients would come in every two weeks to receive uh, a penile injection with this, and what we showed here was that there was a significant uh, decrease in the curvature, as you see in the patients receiving interferon. This was only in six injections. I typically use 12 injections. Uh, when it came to their subjective improvement, those patients on the interferon had significantly better improvement. Looking at a number of studies, there are 
it has been benefit in this, and it's an interesting that a lot of studies didn't even perform intralesional plaque injections, but injected the, the interferon alongside the plaque. But there has been uh, uh, suggested benefit in this area. So interferons are a, between a grade A and grade B uh, uh, recommendation for use, much the same as verapamil is used in many clinical uh, circumstances. Uh, collagenase, you've just heard Dr. Bellamente present this before. This is the new kit in the block, and uh, we've just completed the phase two trials. From the, in the 1980s and 1990s, there were a number of pilot studies that showed benefit in small numbers of patients, as shown right here. Uh, the phase two trial was just looked at, at efficacy and safety, most importantly, and was completed a few months ago. But you can see overall there was a change from baseline compared to placebo of 20 30% to 11% when it came to the uh, penile curvature. When it came to bother score, there was an a, a significant change from baseline. When we looked at the penile uh, uh, curvature improvement at 36 weeks, we can see a significant improvement of those patients in the uh, Zyaflex arm compared to the placebo. Uh, the overall change from baseline, this is with modeling, and this is a few days after the injection that the actual surgeon bends the penis and gets a cracking or a popping sound. You can see there was a substantial benefit. Also, when it came to penile curvature greater than 25% improvement at 36 weeks, you can see that the uh, modeling group did better. The overall change from baseline, you can see without modeling, was not significant from placebo. And the likewise, when it came to without modeling, uh, what did, wasn't the same benefit when it came to improvement. So the efficacy and safety of uh, overall showed a benefit when it came to reduction in penile curvature and improvement in Peyronie's disease with the modeling group when it came to without modeling, which is a technique that's used by the uh, surgeon uh, showed a, a benefit. The safety profile, which was the phase two trial was looking at, showed uh, consistent with previous Zyaflex studies done uh, uh, as pilot studies, but it was well tolerated. There was no significant uh, complications systemically or locally, and for the most part, there was just pain and bruising in, in most cases. Um, Indications for surgical, I'll, I'll just mention that also the phase three style uh, trials are now about to start and uh, a different uh, multi-center uh, group will be looking at this, including our center. Uh, indications for surgical reconstruction of Peyronie's disease is once you have established disease, patients can't en engage upon uh, sexual activity and they've either failed uh, conservative or minimally invasive therapies, and the patient himself understands the chances of success and failure. Uh, importantly, a lot of patients who come and see you don't recognize that Peyronie's disease does not form into a malignancy, and that's one of the fears that they have. Um, the different surgical techniques I won't go into, but there are plication procedures, there's graft-based procedures where we incise the plaque, and sometimes when it's calcified, we have to excise these things, and if a patient does have uh, cavernosal insufficiency or a venous leak phenomenon, we may have to place a penile prosthesis and then do ancillary uh, procedures at the same time. So in conclusion, uh, we do not have a full understanding of the pathophysiology, and this in itself quick uh, compromises our evolution of treatment strategies, and I think we all recognize that. It's very similar with Dupuyren's contracture. Uh, ultimately, multi-centered, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials are necessary for any type of treatment. And combination therapy is uh, probably going to be advantageous, especially when it comes to minimally invasive or oral type of treatments. Uh, currently, surgery is still the gold standard, but it does have certain caveats and concerns. And it's very important when dealing with these patients that you spend some time with them, counsel them about these things, because there are certain uh, psychological overlays when it comes to dealing with Peroni's patients. So I thank you for your attention.